you know, some of this stuff about green building that's interesting, it goes way back to Austin in the early 1980s, and I don't think a lot of folks recognize that there are some neat things that came out of Austin. There was an awful lot of very bright people and a lot of energy that was going on here in the early 1980s. For example, when we started the Austin Energy Star program, and I happened to work for an architect at the time who was asked to be on the mayor and city council's commission to figure out how we can divest from the South Texas nuclear power plant. What can we do to incent people to save energy so we don't me need to build a new power plant? And the idea was to get people to save energy by helping them buy more energy efficient washing machines and dishwashers and, and air conditioners and light bulbs. And we called it the Austin Energy Star program because Austin is the star in the center of Texas. And I don't know if many of you realize that, that that Federal Energy Star program, that little star you see on light bulbs and appliances, was all based on the program that started here in Austin in the early 1980s. It was, stuff, it was something that came out of Austin. It was the first of its programs in the United States, if not North America. Uh, and it did, by the way, end up, because saving energy is much less expensive than building a new power plant, it saved the city millions of dollars it actually costs one-third as much money to incent people to save energy than to build a new power plant. And the city doubled in size before it needed to get a new source of power. It was that effective a program. So I wasn't sure how many of you knew that that came out of Austin. But then what also came out of Austin was this idea of conserving water because we weren't sure of what was going to happen with our rights to the Colorado River for our drinking water. And we also noticed that there was a problem with landfill space and nobody wanted to have a new landfill next to their neighborhood. So the city looked into where a lot of the trash was coming from and a good 40 to 50 percent was coming from the construction industry. So the program went on to incent builders to recycle cardboard and steel and wood and sheetrock to minimize the stuff that went to the landfill. And then we did this water incentives to get you to put in more energy, uh, more water uh, efficient toilets and things like that. So now we weren't just saving energy, we were doing other things. And the term got batted around, what do we call the program? The Austin Eco Program? The, the Austin Green Program? Green Austin? And the term Austin Green Building Program came about. And that was how the term green building or green builder came about. It was right here in Austin back in the mid-1980s. The oldest and most established green building program in the world is Austin's. It far precedes the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED program, and that's important because it's a vetted program. We get to see what's worked and what hasn't worked, and unlike any other program out there, we actually adjust the incentives according to what works. For example, do rain barrels really make people save water? The answer is not really. But let's instead put people's incent or put incentive money into making folks plant more uh, drought tolerant landscaping. It's the only program out there that actually has that feedback loop. So let's just talk a little bit more about some of this stuff and where this green building program or where this green building movement really came from and where it's going. To me, green building boils down to these three very basic things. It's reduced consumption of stuff, energy, water, building materials. It's also improved health. You, know, you, you can't do a very energy efficient building and make your occupants get sick. We learned that in the 70s. And then it's also reduced environmental impact. It's always better to remodel a house in Clarksville or Terrytown or downtown than it is to build a new house out in the hinterlands because you're already dealing with an existing infrastructure. So from a carbon footprint point of view, Remodeling is a great way of, re of green building. But we can't talk about all that stuff today, but we can talk about some of the things like, let's look at energy conservation. How do you prioritize energy conservation strategies? Well, one evening I was looking at this old diet book. My wife is very much into diets, and the old uh, USDA uh, food guide pyramid gave me an inspiration. At the base of the pyramid, you'll see it talks about filling up primarily on your fruits, vegetables, meats, poultry, grains, uh, getting your basics in your diet before you go to the top of the pyramid and get your sugars and salts and things like that. Let's take care of the basics first. And it dawned on me that that's a great analogy for the energy guide pyramid. At the very base, what you always want to do first before you think about buying solar collectors or wind turbines or tankless water heaters is make sure you don't build the house any bigger than it has to be, or make sure it doesn't 
It's tightly built, so you're not trying to air condition all of your neighborhood. You can't air condition your neighborhood. You want to air condition your home only. You've got to pay attention to solar orientation. It doesn't matter how much insulation's in your walls if you have unshaded windows facing west. And then take advantage of the trees to shade your home or your building and also to protect you from the winter winds. The point is these are very basic and incredibly effective things to do that don't cost a lot of money, but you do have to think. And then going up the pyramid, then use your power efficiently. Get energy efficient appliances and light bulbs and air conditioning systems. But the reason why they're not as effective is because they'll break. They'll need to be replaced and replaced and replaced. These things down here, once they're instituted into the project, are there for good. They're passive. These are active. And then once you've done both of those things, designed or programmed out the project intelligently, put in efficient equipment to use your power efficiently, then and only then you can look to see if it's worthwhile investing in solar panels or wind turbines or things like that because there you're trying to produce your own power. So it's a lot less expensive saving energy than it is trying to produce more energy. Just like on a very larger scale, the city of Austin found it was a lot less expensive incenting people to save energy than to build a new power plant. And to make that point, the single most expensive strategies are still the least effective, and the most effective strategies are the least expensive. So I think that, I hope that helps put things in perspective because we all get bombarded with these folks who want to sell us a solar system on the roof or sell us a new water heater and just try to keep this in mind. Uh, and let me give you now some examples about a lot of this stuff and why you want to make sure you have your priorities in place first. There are lots of builders and architects who are trying to capitalize us on this idea of being green, but let's be critical and cynical for a minute, okay? What's wrong with this solar house or this solar house, knowing what I just told you? What you see here is about a $10,000 solar system on these homes, but you also see unshaded windows that are increasing the air conditioning costs significantly. And you'll notice something else. The blinds are closed. So the folks who are living in there are uncomfortable with all that glare. So they close the blinds, and then what do they do? They turn on the lights, which uses more electricity. And what do the lights do? They produce heat, which th makes for even more work for the air conditioner. So when you model a home like this, you'll actually find that if they had just shaded these windows, they could have saved more energy a year than those solar panels will ever produce. You see, so there's an example of do green by design before you get into green by gizmo. And, and I know about this stuff because this is my own home. I was lucky enough to have some good breaks in the real estate business years ago that allowed me to build this in Terrytown. Well, I had never owned a house with a swimming pool before. We'll get to that in a minute. But I also did design the roof to take advantage of a future solar rebate that might be coming down from the city of Austin. The slope was just right. Uh, the orientation was right. It was very much by design. We set up the house to accept the solar system in the future, except we didn't get the word to the mechanical contractor, and he popped a few vents through the roof right where we wanted to put solar panels. So that's something else, again, you've got to communicate well. But look, um, so I've had this system now since, I think, 2004, and I've also had that swimming pool uh, all this time. I learned why they call them active solar systems. I never knew. But who wouldn't realize that you have to actively participate in their maintenance and work every year? <laughs> That's me, before I lost a few pounds, up on the roof. You have to do this about twice a year if you want to get good performance out of your solar system. I don't think very many Americans know that or are going to do it. So let's just put this solar system in perspective based on my experience. It's a $16,000 system, today's dollars. I paid a lot more than that for it. And it saves me about actually $25 to $35 a month now. You can do the payback analysis. It's somewhere out near <laughs> Venus. <clears throat> now, albeit that's at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, if we were in Hawaii and, get, and, and electricity was 45 cents a kilowatt hour, it would be a very different story. But you still have to do this math. But look, let's compare it. Remember I said about the basic bottom of the pyramid where design decisions are more important. Even in my house, too, when I realized when I shaded these windows with these broad overhangs, they save me more energy every year than that $16,000 solar system does on the roof. But unlike the solar system on the roof, the window shading keeps it comfortable in the house, it reduces glare, and it makes it so we don't have to clean the windows or repaint the house as often. So it reduces a lot of maintenance, and you don't have to do anything. 
the overhangs won't break. The solar system will eventually have to be replaced. So let's move forward and talk about some other thoughts regarding what do you do? What do I mean when I say programming a project so that you can use less energy by design? Well, we find we have to educate our clients and, and help them think through the consequences of some of the requests they might have when they're sitting down with us to remodel their home or to build a new home. Now, I think this is where leadership occurs. You have to, a doctor's got to talk to his patient about not going skiing the week after he had knee surgery. And um, an architect has to talk to their clients about the consequences of some of the things they might want. If they're looking to remodel a home and make it very green, we might start off by saying, well then, gee, why don't you look for a house that's on an east-west running street? Why? It's because most of the windows in most homes are in the front and the back. And if the lot is on an east-west running street, that means the majority of your windows are facing south and north which means you have very few, fewer windows facing west, which increases your air conditioning needs. So a the very same house facing south, when you turn it 90 degrees and face the front windows west, will probably need 50% more air conditioning and be a lot less comfortable. So if you're interested in starting off with an energy efficient home or building a home, look for a lot or home on an east-west running street. Very basic, but can make a big difference. If you buy an existing home, and this is to the point of waste reduction, don't ever scrape it with a bulldozer. Give it to Habitat for Humanity or some group that will deconstruct it to get the viable parts of it out of there. There is a huge tax benefit to this. If, it's a, if you have it appraised, let's say the structure is appraised at $75,000, and you give it to someone like ha Habitat for Humanity and they take it apart for the parts, then you just got a $75,000 write-off on your income taxes. It's a shame to see how many people don't know this and just scrape a house off a lot and lose that opportunity. So in this case, you can save yourself a lot of money and also do good for society. Or if you're remodeling, as these folks were of this home down in, T in Terrytown, they wanted more energy efficient windows. They talked to us about the benefits of them. And then I said, well, if that's important to you, why don't we rethink what you want to do to this house? They had wanted to add on to the back of it to get a bigger kitchen, a family room, and a nice master suite. We see a lot of this in Terrytown. We said, if, if you're really into energy efficiency, why don't we scrap that idea and put a second floor in the house and put all the bedrooms on the second floor? So then we can take the existing square footage of the downstairs and give you a family room and a larger kitchen. And by making it a two-story house, we can probably save you 30% on your energy bills because when you go to bed at night, you're only air conditioning that floor. That one's off, that floor is off. And by day, you're only air conditioning or heating that floor and that floor is off. So you see, just by doing two stories instead of a spread out one story, you can cut your energy bills significantly. There's an example of green by design. It has very little to do with the gizmos, but a lot to do with the thought process. Or we might say we like tall ceilings because they're impressive looking, but when you're air conditioning a home or a building, the more cubic feet of air there is, the more air you have to condition. So go easy on that. Maybe do nine foot ceilings with a few accent ceiling heights here and there. This is a house Al and I did for Better Homes and Gardens. It was sort of the every man's green home. Very interesting looking home, but with reasonable ceiling heights, so we didn't have to air condition, heat, dehumidify, filter that many cubic feet of air. Who would have thought? 